I know. I haven't done YouTube in a long time. But I figured this was about as perfect time as any to give it a go again. I don't know if I'm going to be doing this too often. I don't know if I'm gonna, this is going to be like the last video I ever make. Or if this is going to be the first of a lot of videos that I make. Concerning politics or whatever I want to do. But. Um, I'm hyper focused on it right now. In this particular moment. At 2.30 a.m. Um, but. Yeah. Other than those caveats. I guess you could call them. I'm here now, and I'm gonna make some make some content that about 70 people will watch. But I want to do it because then I can look back at it and be like, "Hey, I I made a video and I put it on the internet." And that's that's more than some people can say. Probably for the best for them, but you know. Everybody has their cup of tea, whatever. The reason I'm making this video is because I'm writing a manifesto and I want to kind of get my thoughts in order on about why I believe the things that I do before I go on to the final drafting of that manifesto. I've completed a lot of it, but I want to make sure that I am firm in why. And so this is kind of like a way of me to more harden the the mold of my belief system uh, and the things that I believe and in the way that I think of them just to make sure that I'm firm about what I'm writing uh, I don't want to write something that I'm gonna start disbelieving in about two weeks um, which is partly why the manifesto I am writing is gonna be about broad topics rather than specific ones because well I am a socialist, and I think that I'm going to probably be a socialist for a long time. It's a more broad political viewpoint that I have, whereas if I were to do make a videos on specific topics or write a manifesto on a specific topic, it wouldn't really be up to date probably after like a year. I'd probably change my stance, even, even just a little bit. And then I'd be like, wow, well, this sucks because now I have an outdated opinion on the Internet. So if I don't rectify it, then that's what people think I will think. Which is also the reason I made the video responding to my old videos. Because I didn't want people to think I was an edgy conservative anymore. Um, also because of the same reason that I'm doing this video. I just felt like doing it in the moment. And so I did it. And that is partly why I'm doing this video too. So, without further ado. I'm going to start doing that. On a, right now, actually, like, right this very moment. When I was in high school, I was a pretty bombastic conservative. Bombastic being in the literal sense. I was a vocal but rather superficially charged young man. I only really cared about winning arguments or being perceived as correct. I never actually cared about being right. I know this because when arguing, I would do extremely surface-level research in order to gain the edge during the argument itself. This demonstrated a sort of post hoc justification system for a lot of my beliefs. Beliefs that I only really parroted from YouTubers and political pundits that I liked at the time. But when the COVID-19 pandemic became a very real reality, my goal shifted. I no longer cared about being perceived as correct. This was the first time I actually cared about eliminating misinformation. This was also the first issue that I took an extremely left-leaning stance on. I was pro-mask mandates, pro-vaccine mandates, and in a way, pro-empirically based fear-mongering. All because I was actually concerned about the safety of not only myself, but my friends and family. To ensure that safety, I thought, I ought to discredit as much misinformation as possible. To that end, I succeeded. I warned people about the danger of the virus and told people to prepare for lockdowns and such. In the end, I was right about almost all of it. This day I collect studies and data to ensure that any misinformation that is being spread that I see will be thoroughly disproven. I think, overall, COVID-19 is what made me a leftist, or at least started me on the path to being a leftist. 
COVID-19 was the first issue where I genuinely reflected on the goals of the party that I aligned myself with, and really saw the amount of harmful arguments and information I would see being spewed out of it. This started making me trust my other opinions less, even if that fact wasn't known to me at the time. Because of that, I'm here now, about to share the beliefs that I currently hold and have come to adopt over the past four years. Hello, sorry for the mic quality change and sorry for the uh, voice change. I'm a little sick and I just fucked with my mic a little bit to make it sound a bit better. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Uh, on to the rest of the video though. The issue that defines my opposition to capitalism the best would be, without a doubt, climate change. Climate change, whether you, the viewer, like it or not, is a fact about reality. Climate change happens on Earth a lot, in fact. An example of climate change being a naturally occurring phenomena would be ice ages. They happen every 100,000 years, and then the globe heats up to a livable temperature again, during an interglacial period, which is what we're currently living in. The real problem is that we jumpstarted and are currently proliferating a climate event colloquially called global warming, though this term is hardly accurate, as some places are even getting colder. This is not an indication of another ice age, however, because as previously stated, they only happen every 100,000 years, and it's only been about 20,000 since the last one. The planet naturally heating up is out of the question too, because interglacial periods are not necessarily hot periods, they are simply periods that are not ice ages within an ice age cycle. The planet's climate is becoming disorderly, not because of any naturally occurring phenomena, but because of a greenhouse effect stirring our planet. This effect is being caused by humans, that is the short explanation. A longer explanation is that this problem is, in large part, being caused by human industrialization, mass agriculture, deforestation, reliance on fossil fuel based transportation and energy production along with the propagation of capitalism. Industrialization is a reason because when humans started industrializing, we gained the ability to mass produce. This allowed us to manufacture things like stealing cars on a much larger scale, both of which granted us with wonders, but at the cost of a very large carbon footprint. Regardless of the emissions simply producing these things, steel allowed us to build railways that house trains that gave off pretty large emissions by themselves. Cars and other automobiles still, and to this day, have a large carbon footprint. Overall, while we gained access to wonderful technologies, the physical creation of these products and the products themselves both have substantially large carbon footprints that are contributing to the ongoing greenhouse effect. The second reason, mass agriculture, sees cattle farms that produce massive amounts of greenhouse gases simply because of the animals they house. Cows produce an ungodly amount of methane, which, like carbon dioxide, is a greenhouse gas. Even rice production has a significant greenhouse footprint. And land that could be used for forests is instead used for crops, though much of this food is going to go to waste anyways due to food service policies that throw away massive amounts of food. Speaking of forests, when you deforest an area, that destroys a large carbon sink that our planet needs to stay healthy. CO2 emissions wouldn't be so much of a problem if the, all that carbon had a place to go. But every year, more and more forests are destroyed, including massive carbon sinks like rainforests. Every year, bit by bit. Our rainforests are deforested, either by direct human hands or the increased rate of wild fires due to rising temperatures and extended droughts thanks to climate change itself. This demonstrates that some aspects of climate change, while human-caused, end up being self-repeating cycles. The more forests that are destroyed, the more climate events happen, which destroy more forests, which cause more climate events that destroy more forests, and yada yada, so on and so forth. The reformist solution is clear reforestation and advocacy for and the installment of legal protections of our essential ecosystems. Side note, thanks to Biden and passing the Willow Project, it seems like that's going to be increasingly hard in the future, though the largest fix to the problem would be getting rid of big oil. Transportation, industry, and power generation all rely on fossil fuels, which when burned or otherwise used, emit massive amounts of greenhouse gases. In fact, it isn't even close to the other reasons. The combined emissions from fossil fuel reliance totals to about 90% of all emissions. Nothing else compares. We rely on gas for our cars, we rely on coal and oil for our power generation, and we burn fuels to create energy that enables manufacturing. The reason? It's cheap, it's easy, and it's plentiful. That and the propagation and the infinite expansion of capitalism. Oil is a very lucrative business, so who would want to part with it just to save the planet? Not oil billionaires, that's for sure. They lobby for their industries and against renewables. Money buys them the proliferation of their wealth and influence. This proliferation allows them to expand, set prices arbitrarily, and sometimes receive tax cuts. These same billionaires donate to large political propaganda machines like PragerU, hoping to instill younger generations with a pro-fossil ideology, which in turn allows them to continue their business. Who's going to stand against them if everyone believes in them? 
These billionaires also contributed to the large anti-nuclear propaganda campaigns of the last six decades. Even when nuclear power is by and large and by the numbers, the safest power generation humanity has access to. It's also the most substantive. Billionaires are ignorant to the fact that reliance on fossil fuels is literally killing humanity. They're simply thriving in a system that incentivizes and rewards greed at the cost of broad or sometimes even interpersonal empathy. Renewables and nuclear are not simply as profitable, but they threaten their industry, especially when these woke leftists out here pronouningly activisting for their replacement. When it comes to fossil fuels, it is largely a planned reliance. Capitalism enables this. The reliance on fossil fuels would not have lasted this long without capitalism, in fact. This is because we would not have seen as humongous a propaganda campaign against not only the very concept of climate change, but also its solutions. Solutions that are welfare-centric as opposed to profit-centric expansion. Therefore, they cannot exist. Despite this, though, they do exist. But not without heavy research and development, funding renewable infrastructure, and a growing number of advocacy groups for these solutions. Funding, which partly comes from government offices like the EERE and nonprofit organizations. Corporations do help sometimes, but when they do, it usually doesn't come without a cost. For example, Tesla is THE electric vehicle company, though they are not without many, many faults. They export cheap labor from countries to extract essential materials in order to make their cars cheaper so they can sell more. But this creates a self-serving issue where we exploit extremely bad labor practices of other countries to make materials cheaper, then we exploit our own in-house workers to make sh manufacturing cheaper, then we as consumers buy their stuff which enables them to do it all over again. This is a profit-centric business, not a human-centric business, no matter what Elon Musk says. Tesla may be the company spearheading an alternative fuel system for our transportation, but it doesn't come without its complications that arise due to capitalism and its global stronghold. The reasons these problems exist under capitalism is because of its intrinsic characteristics, which incentivize greed over humanitarian issues, and its framework that operates based on the expansion of profit rather than the distribution of needs. This characteristic has instigated the destruction of ecosystems, the destruction of economies in select countries such as Venezuela, due to it being a petrol state and a global capitalist economy. The exploitation of our planet's resources and the ongoing likelihood of humanitarian crises via climate change caused by droughts, logistics disasters, flooding, and so much more. All in the name of privatized profit and human greed. Solving climate change doesn't come from philanthropy. It requires an upheaval of the system that is directly causing it. We don't save our golden goose by taking away the knife the poacher has to its neck. We save the golden goose by removing the poacher from the situation entirely. Alright, this is the section that proves why I should not be a video essayist. There's gonna be no fucking graphics anymore because this is the listening section. I am way too lazy, I just wanna get this video out today. Please God, just watch the video and don't care. You should listen to it in the background while doing something else. Growing up, I never really saw my parents happy with their work. They would always come home exhausted and tired. On bad days, they would come home irritated and jumpy because of how stressful their work was. My father is a construction painter, whereas my mom has been in multiple jobs, but is currently making a career out of being a paralegal. Both of my parents often complain about their work, or sometimes even completely shutting off because of it. My father has told me indirectly that his work is unfulfilling, and has directly told me that it makes him unhappy. Why would I want a life like this? My father works a blue-collar job, which should be hard, but it should not be this stressful on not only his body, but his mental state too. There is a difference between a job with bad days and a bad job. Most jobs are bad jobs. Even with my mom working a fairly comfortable job, a job that many would consider good, she's not really entirely happy with her job either. I've worked too. I worked at Target for a little bit in the tech department, and it was not a very fun experience. I was overworked, mainly because every day that I was scheduled, I was the only person working and closing in that department. Oftentimes, I'd have to pick up the slack that the morning team would leave behind, leaving me with extra work and full freight to push. This, along with my superiors breathing down my neck, was very stressful. Not only was I essentially taking on extra work, but I was also encouraged to stay up to an hour past my shift ending, and condescended to when I wanted to go home on time. All of this on top of being undertrained. Most of the essential aspects of my job were taught to me by former employees when they were buying stuff from my department. Spider apps, how to properly unlock glass cases, all of that kind of stuff. All taught to me by customers who were former employees or working at other similar stores because I didn't know how to do it and I wasn't taught how to do it. 
It didn't help that my managers were always either unresponsive or busy at the time. But customer always comes first, right? So I need to get this done now, I would think. And no, I didn't hand them the tools to do these things. They simply explained it to me as I attempted to do it. So there was no breach of security there. I also had just come out of high school without doing any physical activities during my time there. So my body was thoroughly unprepared for the rapid transition. Two months in, my calves started locking up from the constant walking back and forth and pushing and hauling stuff for nearly eight hours straight. This conjoined with minimal break time because we were encouraged to park at the back of the parking lot. So getting to my car during my break shaved off two minutes, leaving me two minutes to get back as well. Along with getting food, that left me with only about eight minutes of actual break time. This led to a buildup of physical damage in my muscles that would never fully rejuvenate until my next day off. And with my previous lifestyle of relative sedentariness, this created a lot of problems for my legs. The solution? Take painkillers. Every day. Twice a day. This is not healthy. I also had my set hours change without my permission multiple times, which led to most of these physical issues. With the social isolation that came with working an entire department by myself, and with my coworkers rarely coming by on top of being the closer, I was not having a good time. This was my very first job, by the way. Undertrained, unfairly scheduled, and sold half-assed solutions to the problems that just kept building. All while being hounded for my job performance because I wasn't able to do two to three people's work in the limited time that I was allotted. My friend, who worked at the same store, shared similar plights. Overworked, underpaid, and early on, undertrained, like me. But they worked at guest service, so they got to deal with most of the customers, whereas I only had to deal with some. Another one of my friends worked at Starbucks. They were often hounded because they would call out for real mental health crises by their managers, and denied PTO because they need the workers, or berated because they had to call out for literal doctor's appointments concerning those very same mental health crises. Another one of my friends worked at Lowe's. On intelligent and incompetent management, on top of a piss poor and extremely entitled consumer base, with, at the beginning at least, extremely bad scheduling practices, and essentially offloading multiple people's work onto them simply because the managers can't get their shit in order. All while the CEOs of these companies take massive bonuses every year because of all the hard work they do, despite their workers making them all of their profit and getting shit on for it. This is not a just get a different job problem either, because these are the types of jobs that are available to people of my age and education status. The only time you could get a better job is if you could do an internship, but most of those internships require prior experience in the thing you're interning for. And it's not just, oh, well, you don't have to work. No, they do. People who work in these places need to eat. They need to pay rent. They need to pay insurance, etc. They can't just not work or just quit and find a better job. They have bills to pay or else they die. That's how the system works. The system is coercive whether you like it or not. You may not be told at gunpoint to work, but your expenditures that you need to pay are held to you at gunpoint. There's only a single layer of separation here. So why is this a system I should be in favor of? As someone who has worked and will need to work very soon and is not looking forward to the upcoming experience, why should I support a system that allows the structure and corporate behavior? Why should I be a proponent of a system that incentivizes alienation of its low-level workers, promotes people to management positions who are wildly incompetent as opposed to people who have real skill and experience, all while this very same system gives these managers and their higher-ups massive bonuses instead of giving those bonuses to the workers who earn those higher-ups all of their profit? Because they carry the risk? That would be plausible if they weren't able to completely deduct all of those losses if their company fell through, amounting to minimal damage on their financial security, but putting all of their workers out of jobs in the middle of a course of society. The capitalist takes minimal risk, does minimal work, and exploits their workers to gain profit. Why should I support a system like this instead of a system where everybody in any given org or company has a say? Over an alternative where all workers that provide actual labor are given the respect and compensation they deserve. Over a human-centric system. Human well-being is what I value the most. From the time that I have actually been a pro-capitalist, and from the experience that I have and that my close friends and family have, all of this has simply told me that the system I live under is a system of exploitation. Not even touching on rampant consumer culture dictating our social lives, essential needs being commodified like water or health insurance, you know the thing you need to not accrue tens of thousands of debt from preventable disease that remains uncured specifically for profit reasons? Or even about homelessness and the fact that there are more empty houses and apartments than there are homeless people? Or that tens of millions of Americans suffer from food insecurity each year because our welfare programs are managed and structured so poorly that a person with less disposable income than someone under the poverty line can be denied things like food stamps because they have a decent wage. 
I don't know, man. I feel like there's a lot of reasons to oppose a system that has its very foundation rooted in the heart of human greed. I hope for a system where work is dignified, pays well, and allows for a healthy work-life balance. You should not have to work to live, and you should not have to live for your work. We need to put the power back into the hands of the people. These problems are systemic, and so are the solutions. I believe that one of the possible solutions is the advent of socialism. Functionally, the enactment of socialism would democratize workplaces, install a true democracy within our federal government, where the people themselves have ultimate authority over representatives, including the Supreme Court and the President. Through my vision of socialism, it would be a welfare state in which healthcare is free in some way, whether that be through a single-payer system or a guaranteed health insurance at a basic level, I don't really know. It would also see free basic housing. Keep in mind though, I'm not saying houses, just basic housing, so like high-density apartments and stuff like that. Meaning everyone would have guaranteed but ultimately optional access to small apartments that someone or a family could live in. This would allow people to not have to worry about rent or living paycheck to paycheck. It would also see everyone eligible for programs similar to, but stronger than, food stamps at all times with robust water infrastructure so no one is required to pay for food or water at any point. Obviously, everyone could still buy water and food if they wanted to. I mean, things like Fiji would still exist, but just enough infrastructure so no one is required to buy food and water simply to survive. I also advocate for free higher education and an overhaul to our current public education system, making it more intelligence and creative centric rather than work and complacency centric. And if you don't believe me that it is work and complacency centric, just look at what Rockefeller said. The effect this would have would be clear. Dignified work since all workplaces are inherently democratized. This fact would often lead to higher pay, lower hours, but maintaining the same or better productivity as we see now. We would also see people who move out of their parents' house still being able to follow their educational goals and passions without having to worry about crippling debt or living off ramen noodles to survive. This would eventually lead to the whole of society being more educated and open to learning. Yes, taxes would rise dramatically, but overall disposable income would also rise. And depending on your setup, your entire paycheck could be guaranteed to go towards things you want to buy, rather things you have to buy. This is not implausible either. We see plenty of countries who operate on welfare states having these exact effects on their economies and their societies. Our government being a true democracy would allow for easier tweaking and tuning. Everyone being more educated would allow for everyone to make more informed decisions on what policies to vote for to truly fix any hiccups we might experience rather than whining on and about Twitter all day. Of course there will be freeloaders and people who just don't want to work, but we have those kind of people in our current system. A transition to socialism isn't going to exacerbate that. It might even see a decrease in un unemployment and willful unemployment. This could be due to since healthcare would be free, that includes things like therapy. So people who suffer debilitating problems could see their problems properly treated, which would allow them to participate in the labor market. People would also be more passionate about their work, since you have access to more disposable income which you gain from a workplace with employee-centric working conditions rather than manager-centric. We would even see lower rates of crime. More educated people with less financial worries means less incentive to commit crime. Free healthcare, and by extension free or at least affordable therapy, means people with mental health issues wind up committing less crime as well, including suicide. This also extends to drug offenses. A rehabilitative response system as opposed to our current criminalization response would see lower overall drug offenses in the future and lower rates of addiction overall, meaning lower deaths to drug overdose and lower uh, drug-related crimes. Sure. A transition to socialism would mean a lot of change, and a lot of work, and a lot of policy to do it right. But I believe with the right push and the right voter base, we can get this transition thoroughly underway within our lifetime, and that's a good thing. A lot of the work will come from changing our culture and how we view both ourselves, productivity, work ethic, and the economy itself, and the economy's place in our lives. That cultural shift is already happening, however, so eventually this transition will be upon us whether we like it or not. So we might as well start brainstorming now on how we can make it work and how we can use this new system to make our country better and our society happier. Overall, I am a socialist because capitalism as a system requires, incentivizes, and rewards greed at the cost of sociological and sometimes even interpersonal empathy. This has led to things like climate change being proliferated despite the severe repercussions we are already facing and have yet to face, all in the name of profit. It has led to things like slavery, child slavery, 12-hour workdays for minimal pay, the continuation of slavery through foreign labor and our penal system, extreme homelessness, high crime rates. 
Food insecurity for tens of millions of Americans. Healthcare insecurity for tens of millions of Americans as well. Housing insecurity even for millions of Americans. Horrible working conditions. Minimal pay for maximum effort, rebranded as max pay for minimal skill, all while your managers, who objectively do less labor than you and make the company less money, get paid more. People not having a say in their lives, their work-life balance, or even what they get to spend the money that's supposed to be compensation on. Living under a government with so much power over its people, yet we the people have minimal power over it. We don't really decide the president who has authority over passing or vetoing federal legislation. The electoral college decides that the majority of the time. We don't decide our Supreme Court justices who have ultimate authority over judicial and constitutional precedents that are ultimately just as vulnerable to evil as any other person is. The president decides that. We don't decide what welfare programs are canned or introduced. We don't decide how our economy is supposed to work, and we don't decide who truly represents us. We don't decide any of it. Whenever we do end up being the ones who decided, it's in spite of outside forces. Things like lobbying, private donations to specific campaigns, the Supreme Court deciding against your rights, etc. We win in spite of outside opposition. But why should we need to win in spite of any outside forces? The narrative and framing of this country and its documents are pro-democracy and pro-for the people, by the people. Yet the actual functionality of our system runs more like an oligarchy with a democracy cosmetic slathered over it. Please, help install a true democracy. Help dignify your work. Ensure that no one goes hungry, homeless, or even in massive debt because of superficial economic reasons. No one. Not even if you don't work your heart out every single day of the week. No one deserves that. Despite what hustle bros and boomers who bought their house for the price of four rolls of cheese and a high school diploma might tell you. Extreme work ethic and the grind at the cost of yourself is not morally correct simply because the system incentivizes them. It's simply how you succeed in a bad system. But why should we continue to lead a life pleasing a system that overstays its welcome when you could just replace it? And that's why I'm a socialist.